Go ahead and have a seat. Welcome to Village Church. If this is your first time here, my name is Steve. I'm one of the pastors here at Village Church. And as always, I am thankful and grateful to see each and every one of you. If you noticed, we have a new uh, kind of stage environment uh, here. And what that has done is it has aided us in adding extra chairs into the auditorium. And it's a wonderful thing. And the good news is they're all up front. And so... <laughs> I'm going to make a request that, that I have made uh, in all three services in both locations uh, this morning, that if you are the type of person that, that gets here uh, 10 or 15 minutes early and reserves uh, seating, I am so thankful that you are here, but I'm going to ask that next Sunday, instead of reserving them in the back, that you would reserve them closer to me so that I could have a more personal experience uh, with you. Um, I, the closer I get, the better looking I get. Uh, and, and so, so my wife's a lucky woman. Uh, and so if you're in the back, Hey, I love you. I love you, but I want to see more of you. And so if, if you could just do me a favor, it would help us out wonderfully for our guest experience for our first time guests. Oftentimes they will arrive uh, a little bit later and, and it is a very intimidating experience if it's your first Sunday, and you may have experienced this too, and you have to stand in the back worried that you're going to have to walk up in front of everyone and have everyone stare at you. Because let's be honest, that's what we do. We <laughs> stare at them, and we judge them, and we're like, <laughs> sleep in a little bit, <laughs> got a little sleepy in your eyes there. Um, so, so next Sunday, why don't you just do them a favor and, and follow Jesus who would sit closer. I'm telling you, he would, because Jesus loves lost people, and Jesus loves first-time guests. And so because he's so passionately committed to first-time guests, I'm going to ask you to be passionately committed to those first-time guests and come sit up here. Man, it's just, when I see people up here, we become better friends. And the secret to getting to know Steve is sitting up front because I know you care. If you're sitting in the back and you're like, why hasn't Steve become my best friend? It's because I don't like people to sit in the back. <laughs> Point blank. It's just true, all right? So let's go to the Word of God. Romans chapter 8, let's start in verse 28. That's just where I'm going to cut it off. It's just like, I don't, wanna, I don't feel like going anywhere else. I don't feel like I need to go anywhere else. So let's go to Romans chapter 8. Uh, you know, what, one of the wonderful things that God does is that he answers often the questions that plague us. And I think in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, the apostle makes what I believe to be one of the boldest, if not the boldest promise in all of Scripture. And it is that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Those are the two qualifiers. And one of the fascinating things about that text is that while I trust that it's true, it's hard to apply sometimes in my life. Sometimes in life, uh, and really all of our lives, things will either enter into our lives or things will be ripped out of our lives that will bring great doubt about God's plan for our lives or even God's goodness in our lives or even just God's goodness in general. But the good news is uh, that, number one, Jesus has saved us and he has given us a holy calling in which we can trust that there is a God, there is a God who is there, there is a God who is involved, and there is a God who loves me because Jesus died on the cross and Jesus has risen from the dead. But more than that, when it comes to specific instances of my life, sometimes it's not that I'm not anchored in the cross and I'm not anchored in the resurrection. It's that there are times when I struggle to apply that reality into the specific instances when life is hard. And the good news is that God doesn't leave us in a place where he doesn't answer how he's working in those instances. But what can be difficult is for us to trust his answers. And Romans 8, 29 and 30, are these fascinating texts, because what the Apostle Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is meaning to do is to give us evidence for why we can trust that in any and all circumstances, the follower of Jesus knows that everything that comes into our lives or everything that is taken from our lives is going to work the good of God's glory. Note that it doesn't say my good. It's talking about his good, what God defines as good. And so uh, let's read Romans eight twenty-eight through verse 30. And we know 
that for those who love God, all things work together for good to those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom He predestined, He also called. And those whom He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. Number one this morning, I want you to understand that God's sovereignty is the how behind His will. God's sovereignty is the how behind His will. And so I want to qualify this by way of an introduction that's in a unique place, I think, in this sermon. And that is to talk about what I am seeing as a growing trend, not among a specific age group, but among just culture at large, of believing that questions make you deeper than thinking you have answers. And so what I mean by that is what I've experienced over the last really year or two is people bringing questions about God, bringing questions about how God works, questions about the gospel, questions about God's sovereignty and this or that application of life, and then being offended when I say, actually, that is a great question, and let's go to God's word because he has answered that specific question. And finding that many people are being offended that someone would deign to think that there are answers to the questions that you have about life because you believe that your questions make you deeper than if you thought you had answers. And I will tell you that your questioning or the doubts that you have don't always make you deeper. They often just make you more prideful. Because when God has answered a question that you have and you refuse to accept that answer, that's not a sign of humility. That is a sign of self-idolatry. That is a sign that you probably think that God would never do anything that you yourself would not do or God would not do anything that you don't necessarily naturally understand. And I've seen this often where the problem of evil is concerned. And this text, if you want to talk about the problem of evil, this text is important in what some people call a problem. I don't think of it as a problem. I just think of it as an is. God has dealt with evil on the cross. But God is answering the objections that you have to his sovereignty by explaining, not just in a little bit how his sovereignty works, but explaining wholesale. This is how sovereignty works, and this is specifically how his sovereignty works in your life. And so what often happens when people come to me for counseling is, is they are, and I don't know why anyone's shocked by this, but they are shocked at how blunt I am, because if I can't solve your problem in one session, then you need to go to a professional. Let's just be honest with that. <laughs> And sometimes I'll, I'll answer it over email. I have great counseling sessions over email. But the issue that you need to understand in your life is that your refusal to find comfort in God's answers does not say good things about your faith. It says troubling things about, first, your pride, and second, a lack of trust in God. And we play this game as though pride is found in answers. No, oftentimes what you need to understand is pride is found in your questions. Because when you continue to treat as a question something that God has given a direct answer to, what is being revealed in your life is that you refuse to submit to the sovereign God. And that, of course, is rebellion. And it can become a blasphemous thought in your life. I believe that the Bible is clear. Uh, that's one of the four pillars that you bring into the study of Scripture, or rather the proper study of Scripture, is the clarity of Scripture. And it is a vital thing. It doesn't treat the Bible as equally clear, but it does say there is a clarity in all of the Scripture. Here's what I mean. Romans 8, 29 is a little more difficult to understand than John three sixteen. Just based on grammar and sentence structure alone. Because John 3.16 has just something that instantly hits you and it makes perfect sense. God loves me. He gave his son so that I can have eternal life. It's that clear. Romans 8.29 
has the same clarity that John 3.16 has. It just requires a little more study to understand the terminology. That's the difference. God, I believe, through His Word, has answered every question that I can ever have about life to what He wants me to know. Are there things that God knows that I don't? Absolutely. But the problem is, is in treating God as though He is some kind of tyrant for not explaining everything to you. That's pride. He wouldn't be God if you guys always saw eye to eye. He wouldn't be God if He didn't have a greater level of understanding about certain things than you do. God is sovereign and I am not. And by His grace, He has explained to me how His sovereignty works out in my life. And so what you need to see in Romans 8, 29 is a great level of a gracious, sovereign God to be so loving as to say, I want to explain to you how redemption works out in each and every one of your lives on a very personal level. And he begins with a promise that is too good to be true. You know, when I was growing up, there would be these infomercials that would come on the TV and they, I mean, it ruled the day because it was before really the days where internet had, had taken off. And there was just, if you were up late at night, if you were up super early in the morning, there was an oven that could make you the best turkey you've ever had in five seconds. Or there was a way to make $50,000 in three days and lose 100 pounds in the process. <laughs> but as time goes by, what you begin to understand is that if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. And when it comes to the promises that the world can give you where weight loss, financial gain, and culinary skill is concerned, 10 times out of 10, if it seems too good to be true, it absolutely is too good to be true. And so when you read Romans 8, 28, it is that kind of a promise where you are meant, I believe, to look at this and have a reaction that all things working together for good is a promise that is too good to be true. And at a human level, it is. That is why if we're going through a period of pain or a period of suffering and someone has the audacity to look at us and say, remember Romans 8, 28, you want to slap them in the face. But that doesn't make it any less true. Romans 8, 28 is given to you so that you can have a warm blanket on a cold day. It is meant to be the pillow that you rest your head on when you are questioning God. And God does welcome our questions. If you look throughout the scripture, almost everyone in it questions God. Because there are things that God will do in our lives that will evoke a response of, I don't understand why I'm going through this. And time and time again, God welcomes the question. But what God won't do is submit to your refusal to accept his answer. Because he has answered. If you read the book of Job, you will see someone who went through some hard times and had some deep answers, and God accepted every one of his questions until he refused to trust God's answers. And then God, in very clear form, spends a few chapters belittling Job. But how often do you ignore God's belittling of Job so that you can act like your problems are somehow unique and you are somehow special in God's plan and what you are going through is totally different than anything anyone has ever been through in the history of the world and surely God has a different answer for you? No. You are not special. You are not unique. God is special. If I was the special one in this relationship, I would be worthy of worship. And one thing living in this world 39 and a half years has shown me, I am not worthy of worship. <laughs> I am clearly not worthy of worship, but neither are you. So why do you think that your life situation is somehow unique in God's perspective? When God makes a promise such as, if you're one of his followers, 
all things work together for good. What he means to do with that is to put you in your place. To help you to understand, yes, what you are going through is something that God knows. Yes, what you are going through is something that God understands. Yes, He knows it is difficult for you. Yes, He knows there are questions in your mind. Yes, He knows that doubt is entering into the arena of the way that you think. Yes, He knows the anxieties that are plaguing your life. But yes, He has a plan for each and every circumstance. And the most important part of that verse, I think, is what you often overlook. Look at the way he starts verse 28. It starts with three words, but two of them vital. And we know. It doesn't say, and we question. It doesn't say, and we doubt. It doesn't say, we consider. It says, we No, God does not want his followers to walk through this world unaware of his power, control, and will. God wants you to walk through this world with a level of certainty. And that is why the text begins, we know Because when hard things come into my life, and I am not untouched by hard times, when difficult circumstances show up at my door, because doesn't it always feel that way? It always feels like, boom, suffering. Boom, pain. Boom, turmoil. Boom, hard times. God doesn't want me to look to Him and say, I think you've got this, but how often do I do that? I think you've got a will, and I think it's good. No, God wants his children to trust him. God wants his followers to know that his promises are for you in the moment you need them because his promises are easy to trust when I'm having a great day. His promises are easy to trust when everything's going my way. His promises are difficult to trust when I don't know what the other side of this trouble looks like. He wants me to know that he has a sovereign plan behind his will. And he gives us verses 29 and 30 to trust the foundation of how he is going to work. Verse 29 and 30 act as a guarantee. And there's a few important words in verse 29 that I'm going to spend a considerable amount of time this morning unpacking for us because we need that hinge that the entire chapter, all of the no condemnation, all of the victory over sin, all of the power of the Holy Spirit, all of the hope for the future, all of the hope for my prayers now, they all hinge on the beginning of verse 29 when he says, those whom he foreknew he also predestined. That phrase is God's guarantee of your certainty. Foreknown and predestined are two vital words for Christian discipleship because it is God expressing to you that he has absolute sovereignty over every one of his promises and he can be trusted. But our difficulties come when we belittle the sovereignty of God, in my opinion. The sovereignty of God is the pillow that I rest my head on, not my free will. My free will has done nothing but get me into trouble. My free will has done nothing but damn me to hell. My free will has done nothing but give me anxiety. My free will is absolutely corrupted by my sinful nature. In a world that is desperately out to prove that they are good and better than God, we as the people of God need to accept and land that the Scripture does not put my hope in my free will. The Scripture puts my hope solely and squarely in the hands of a sovereign God. Foreknowledge 
is one of the most misunderstood uh, terms in all of Scripture. And so when he uses this term for new, that is the Greek word proegno. And it's from a root word, and I'm going to give you a little bit of original language here because just lovingly, some people think that the Bible was written in English. I, I, it wasn't, all right? The book of Romans in its entirety was for the most part written in Greek. And the word for new doesn't have as much meaning in English as it does in Greek. That is a proper translation of proegno, but it is not as full of a meaning as proegno has in the original language. Because for us, when we say for new, all we think is he knew beforehand. And so I don't know how you were taught, but as a young man, I was taught that what that means is, is that God knew in advance what I would choose, and then he based what he was going to do in my life on what he knew I was going to choose beforehand. The only problem with that definition is that that word doesn't anywhere ever mean that. It doesn't. I'll give you exactly what it means in the original language. It comes from the root word, as I've said, for knowledge, which is prognosco, which has a simple meaning. I'm going to give you a three-word meaning. It just simply means to choose beforehand. But the fullest meaning of that word is this sense of a personal knowledge. To befriend or be acquainted with someone, note this, in a familial way ahead of time or before meeting, implying an exclusivity of choice relative to those not befriended. And so what that word carries with it is a relational knowledge. It is an intimate knowledge, and it is jumping directly off of what we talked about a few weeks ago when it said that God adopted us where which, by which rather we cry, Abba, Father, where the text says because of the adoption that he has brought into our lives, he has made us heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. He's adopted us into his family. He's letting you know in this passage that that means that before you were born, the rest of the scripture goes on to understand, before he even created the world, he chose to have a family level knowledge of you that not everyone in this world is going to experience. That there is a choice that God made to bring you into his family that he doesn't make for everyone. And he amplifies it by adding another key word into the phrase. What's that key word? Predestined. Those whom he what? Foreknew, he also did what? Predestined. Right there, Paul is doubling down in his definition. He's saying that this foreknowledge was so important to God on a personal level in your life that he actually predestined that your life would work out in a specific way in terms of coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Those whom he foreknew, he went an extra step and he predestined. The word predestined has an original meaning that literally means he drew a horizon around your life and he said, this is the path that you will take. God's sovereignty is the how behind his accomplishing of his will. That means that his will is not dependent on me being talented or me being smart or me being good enough or me being, you know, just a little bit more, you know, strategic than everyone else. No, God's will is solely dependent on him. And here's the key. That should make you so thankful. That should give you such comfort. Comfort to the level that no matter what comes into your life that you wish did not come into your life, you look at it and say, he's working all the good. 
He's working all of the good. He's working all of the good. It's not about you. It's about God. In each and every circumstance, God wants me to trust Him. He doesn't want me to trust me. And by His grace, He brings me phrases that prove it. But it goes further than that. And this is why I love Romans 8, 29 through 30. It just keeps getting better. Number two this morning, God's purpose is for you to become like Jesus. God's purpose is for you to become like Jesus. Some of the issues that people have with studying the Bible is that you don't finish the sentence. Is that we will chop it up and we will pretend that for new is just this term that's off on an island by itself and I'm stuck with just having that term. Predestined is just this other term that's off on an island by itself. And so we just need to understand them outside of the context of what they're actually in. That's foolishness. Because what we are tempted to do is we are tempted to read a text and begin with the controversy. We read a text and we begin with our presuppositions. We read a text and we begin with all of our questioning. And that's a really a one-way ticket to bad Bible study. When you're reading the Bible, begin with the context. And you will save yourself from a whole lot of foolishness. Begin with not, how does this strike me? Well, that word predestination, I, I just don't know. I've been asked before, it's so funny, people visit the church, and maybe you're going to do this too, and I want to answer the question before you ask it. People will say, do you believe in predestination? And I always just shoot back. Have you read the book of Romans? <laughs> of course I believe it. It's in there, isn't it? I have to believe it. But the problem that we have is, is that we begin with our anger about a specific term before we begin by saying, what did Paul mean by that term? When the church at Rome received this message, what did they think about that term? See, the original audience is far more important than the contemporary audience. If I ever want to apply anything from the Bible to my life, I have to understand what the original audience thought about it before I ever begin to think, what does America think about it? Good Lord. The words are meant to draw me in to what God is doing in my life. And if you just say, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, and that's where you stop, you will be tempted to enter into an inner dialogue where you think of yourself or other people, and you will then make this rebuttal, but I'm not a robot. What, if I believe this, it just means that I'm some type of pawn on God's cosmic chessboard with no decisions to make. You know, that's not where the thought goes in the text. Here's where the thought goes. Look in verse 29. He says, Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. God's predestination always carries with it a purpose for your life. God has shown what the will that he is working from verse 28 is going to work out in your life in verse 29. You don't have to lay in bed at night any longer staring at the ceiling and saying, what is the meaning of my life? What is the purpose for my life? Does God even have anything going on in my life? Yes, everything that God has done throughout the history of the world was leading to the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is always leading to you through faith, being conformed to the image of His Son. It is always about becoming more like Jesus. And don't you just wish, though, it was a little simpler? I do. I wish that the moment that I came to faith, I came to faith in Jesus Christ when I was 12 years old, I wish and I would have been saved a lot of turmoil in my life if on that day in August of 1992, at the moment that God redeemed me, I just was like Jesus. I was perfect. I would never need any more repentance in my life. I would never make any more mistakes in my life. I would know exactly what God would have me choose in each and every moment in my life. But you know, that's not the way it works out, is it? He tells us, he says, God has predestined you 
to be conformed to the image of his will. And that word conformed is also very important. It's the same word that he uses in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, a very popular text, where he says, don't be conformed to the patterns of this world. So he says, don't be conformed to the world. And in chapter 8, he says, do be conformed to the image of his son. But note what he begins with. He says, this is not going to be a work that God leaves you in charge of. He predestines you to become conformed to the image of his son. Therefore, I can have a certainty that every pain, every pleasure, every hardship, every easy day, everything that I want to celebrate and everything that I want to curse in my life, I can always be certain that God is going to use it to make me more like his son. There's a purpose behind every pain. And God wants me to be aware of that. He doesn't want me to walk through this life doubting. He doesn't want me to walk through this life questioning. He doesn't want me to walk through this life not knowing. He wants us to know that He will conform me to the image of His Son. It reshapes my prayers. Because I don't know if you've experienced this, but when you're going through a period of pain, your prayers look a little different. I'm tempted to, whenever I'm going through a period of pain or whenever I'm going through a period of turmoil, you know, my prayers are pretty simple. I, I, don't, I don't, personally, in my personal life, I don't use a whole lot of whithersoever thou goest, Holy Father, please anoint me with thine sanctification, all right? I don't pray like that. You know what my prayers usually look like? Oh, God, fix it. <laughs> that, that's, that's, that's my personal mantra, all right? So if you want to know, what do Steve's prayers look like on a lot of mornings? Oh, God, it's broke, fix it. Or, oh, God, I'm broke, fix it. And that can have a lot of meanings, all right? I'm physically broken. I'm financially broken, all right? There's lots of broke I need fixed, all right? But man, how self-centered is that prayer? And I try, I'm sometimes very unsuccessful, I try to repent towards a prayer where instead of just beginning with wanting the quick fix, I say, God, how are you using this to make me more like your son. Verse 29 finishes with this statement that Jesus, and I'm going to give you the Steve version, Jesus is meant to be the big brother to lots of younger brothers and sisters. And that is why God is conforming you to his image, because he wants us to follow in his footsteps. Friend, God's sovereignty is less about me getting everything that I want, and it's less about me being a robot, and it's more about the work that God wants to do throughout all of the years of my life, however many of them they are. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul writes this. He said, God saved us and called us to a holy calling. That's vital. He's jumping off of Romans 8, 29 here. He's saying that there is a purpose behind which God has saved you. And it wasn't some impersonal thing where he just brought you to faith in Jesus and then said, you're going to heaven. I've got nothing for you till then. He says he saved us and then called us to a holy calling, which we know was to become more like Jesus, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace. He doesn't ask you, what you want it to look like, he tells you what it's going to look like, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. It's vital for you to understand because every one of you are going to be tempted at some point in your life to believe that your life doesn't matter. You're going to be tempted to buy into the lie that your life is insignificant. You're going to look at it and you say, I've never 
been noteworthy for anything. I've never accomplished something so much that anyone in this world has ever looked and said, wow, you are a success. You are a great person. You are very skilled. We are going to be tempted to look at our lives and believe that we are very small, to believe we are very insignificant, to believe even, oh, why was I born in this area of Virginia? Nothing ever happens here. Why couldn't I have been born where important people are born? And to that, God says, your life is so significant that God planned it before he ever created the world itself. Friend, if you want to understand what predestination to be conformed to the image of God's Son shows, it shows that you matter. It shows that your life has significance to God. Francis Schaeffer is one of my favorite philosophers and apologists and I've been a student of his for years and most of the books that he wrote are from the 70s and 80s. He's gone on to heaven. He wrote a lesser known work that was just all about that and it's called No Perfect People. Excuse me, No Little People, No Little Places. No Little People, No Little Places. And it is about this specific subject. Friend, if God has redeemed you, while no one in the world may ever look, God is. While no one in the world may ever know, God does. You are significant in the plan of God. And He's planned everything to conform you to the image of His Son. God has determined, though, that through that you understand that you need to enter a life of discipleship. You see, note that when we think about our purpose, we don't think about it the way that God does. I think about what job should I have, what house should I buy, what kind of car should I have, what wife should I have, how many kids should I have. And I think that my significance and I think that my purpose is all wrapped up in those things. Does God say that? No. He says the purpose that he has made for your life is for you to be conformed to the image of his son. And you need to find joy in that. The problem that many of us have is we are so prideful that we look at that and we say, that's not enough. And that's why you avoid discipleship. Because you think you've got better things to do. You think you've got important passions to work out. You think that your life needs to be more significant than some meeting between a few people where you just get together and read the Bible. I mean, what is really being accomplished there? I will tell you, the eternal will of the sovereign God is being accomplished in that moment. And when you avoid personal discipleship, you are walking away from the purpose of God in your life. It's so important that He planned it before the ages began. Some of you have bought into a lie that there's something greater than God's plan for your life. And I can trust his plan because, number three, God's promises are certain. God's promises are certain. God's call is final. Romans 8.30 is often referred to as the golden chain of salvation. The Apostle Paul strings together the verbs of God's work in salvation for our life. Note what he says in verse 30. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. He begins again with that word, predestination. A word that should bring comfort to your heart rather than controversy to your mind. That God has a purpose. But then he says, here's how he works it out for you. That's what verse 30 is. Verse 30 takes an eternal plan and says, this is how it works out in your specific life. He says, God predestined your purpose, and through that, He then called you to salvation. That word called is very important. It's the same idea that Jesus talks about in John chapter 6, where He says, no one will come to the Father except those whom the Father draws to Himself. He's wanting you to understand that there is a work of God that goes on to bring you to salvation. Have you ever wondered why two people can hear the same gospel message at the same time in the same room and have completely different reactions? One person says, that's the best news I've ever heard. Who wouldn't want to follow Jesus? 
The God who created me loves me to the extent where he's going to forgive me of every sin that I have ever committed and could ever commit. And then he's going to draw me into a new life based on the resurrection where he's going to make me more like his son. That is great news. I'm going to follow Jesus. And that one person will react that way and the person right next to them will say, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Why would I want to follow Jesus? What's so great about him? I don't even believe that God exists. How could a good God be in such an evil world? And we'll look at it and we'll say, didn't they both hear the same thing? Why did they react totally different ways? Because the calling that he's talking about right there is not the same type of calling that I'm making for you to come to faith in Jesus. He's saying that there is a special call that God himself does and brings into the life of every person that ever comes to faith in Jesus Christ. This is where we can look at and say, God surpasses your quote-unquote free will and opens your eyes to salvation in Jesus Christ so that you will choose him every single time. Those whom he called, he also justified. Justification is a work that we talked about in the first two weeks of this series, so I won't uh, prolong uh, an explanation on it because that would take the rest of the, uh, you know, an entire sermon unto itself. But it is the work that Jesus accomplished for us on the cross. He bore our sin on himself and through his death has brought complete forgiveness into our lives for all of our sin. I am guilty, but in justification, God declares me innocent. Not because I deserve innocence, but because Jesus has said, I will pay the penalty for the guilty. Therefore, they have no penalty to pay anymore. That's what happens in justification. And he's saying those whom he predestined, he also called. And there's a moment in your life where you feel that calling and you come to faith in Jesus. And in that moment, justification becomes a very personal thing. But he doesn't stop there. He then says those whom he justified, he also what? Glorified. Here's what's fascinating. Even if you're a follower of Jesus in this room, you have not experienced glorification. So is that a typo? Did Paul make a mistake? Because if you read it, I don't know if you know English very well. I don't. But that ED on the end, that's past tense. So the Apostle Paul says something that I have not experienced and it was reserved for my future. Romans 8 has been very clear. That future glory is something we haven't experienced yet, but he writes about it in the past tense. Why? Because he's closing his case. And he's saying, God will work all of the good. Here's how he's working all of the good. And you can bank on it as if it's already happened He is going to deliver to every single follower of Jesus an eternal weight of glory that is so certain I'm going to talk about a future reality as though it's in the past tense. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. And there's no chance that that glorification will ever be in question because it's not in my hand. It's in the hand of an eternal, sovereign God who has the power to bring death to life so I know he can be trusted to work my life to his good. But only if you trust Jesus. Only if you trust Jesus. God does not promise to work one ounce of good apart from faith in Jesus Christ. Therefore, if you want God's good, trust Jesus. If you want God's hand, trust Jesus. If you want what God has for you, you must trust Jesus. Then you must follow Him the rest of your life. Every single Sunday... We reflect on what's called the Lord's Supper. The bread represents the broken body of Christ. The cup represents His shed blood. And when we eat and when we drink, we profess to everyone in this room, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I know that some of you may not be followers of Jesus, and not to offend, but I assume some of you are not followers of Jesus. Friend, if that's the situation that you find yourself in today, and if 
you want God to work all of the good. Here's the here's deal, friend. I'm not begrudgingly follow Jesus. I'm with joy following Jesus because I believe a future with Jesus is better than anything else that I could ever have in my life. It brings me great joy to follow Jesus, and I want you to have that same joy. I want you to have the same certainty when you encounter suffering in this world that I have. I want you to have the same hope in such a hard world that I have. And that's why I want you to follow Jesus Christ. If you're in a situation right now where you might be being confronted by the Holy Spirit who's saying you're not a follower of Christ, friend, right here, right now, where you sit, you can become a follower of Jesus Christ. If you will just simply trust Him to pay the penalty for your sin and love Him for it with all of your heart, He will save you. And in just a moment, even as I talk right now, as people are reflecting in communion because they believe in Jesus, I'm going to ask you to do something different. I'm going to ask you, even in your seat, just pray, God, I know I've sinned against you, and thank you that Jesus has paid the penalty for my sin. Please save me. Please save me. If you will pray that and you will mean it, He will. He will save you, and He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And every promise that He has made through Jesus is yours, if you'll trust Him. After the service, maybe find a leader, talk to them. They'll pray with you, and will baptize you into the church. But if you're in here and you are a follower of Jesus, come, proclaim your faith, then go. Be conformed to His image. When you're ready, come. Mm -hmm.